Hello friends, I hope you're keeping well. My name is Ashling, and I'm here today to talk about books as ever. Today I'm gonna to be talking about my most anticipated new releases that are coming up in the next kind of four or five months. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna get cracking. So I'm gonna go in chronological order. So on the 26th of September, there are two books that I'm looking forward to. The first of which is quite a popular one by an author who is incredibly popular. So the book is The Fragile Threads of Power by V.E. Schwab. So V.E. Schwab is obviously known for writing The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. It is the only book that I have read by this author and I really liked their writing style but not so much the actual plot. I'm sorry to break hearts here, but um, this upcoming one is the first book in the Threads of Power series. And I think this is based in a world that has already been written about in another series, but I don't know, this one has kind of captured my imagination and I think I'll give it a go. Uh, so I'm, I'll just read a little bit of the blurb from Goodreads so you have an idea of what it might be about. So once there were four worlds nestled like pages in a book, each pulsing with fantastical power and connected by a single city, London, until the magic grew too fast and forced the worlds to seal the doors between them in a desperate gamble to protect their own. The few magicians who could still open the doors grew more rare as time passed and now only three Antari are known in recent memory. Kel Maresh of Red London, Delilah Barrett of Grey London and Holland Vosiek of White London but barely a glimpse of them has been seen in the last seven years and a new Antari named Kosika has appeared in White London taking the throne in Holland's absence. The young queen is willing to feed her city with blood, including her own, but her growing religious fervour has the potential to drown them instead. And back in Red London, King Rai Maresh is threatened by a rising rebellion, one determined to correct the balance of power by raising the throne entirely. Amidst this tapestry of old friends and new enemies, a girl with an unusual magical ability comes into possession of a device that could change the fate of all four worlds. Her name is Tez and she's the only one who can bring them together or unravel it all. So this sounds like something that has like quite a lot of politics and world building and potentially a lot of really good characterization as well. I did really enjoy the characters from The Invisible Life of Adley LaRue. So I'm hopeful that this one kind of captures me in a way because I really enjoyed that kind of literary writing style but within fantasy so I'm hoping to give this a go. Please let me know if you think I should read any other V.E. Schwab's books before I pick this one up because I'm not that certain on it myself. The next one then it is out on the same day and it's by an author called Ron Rash whom I have never read anything from but apparently he wrote Serena and In the Valley. I don't know a whole lot about this book again because it's something I haven't read or heard too much about. I'll just read you the blurb. So it is told against the backdrop of the Korean War as a small Appalachian town sends its sons to battle. The caretaker by award-winning author Ron Rash is a breathtaking love story and a searing examination of the acts we seek to justify in the name of duty, family, honor, and love. It's 1951 in Blowing Rock, North Carolina. Blackburn Gant, his life irrevocably altered by a childhood case of polio, seems condemned to spend his life among the dead as the sole caretaker of a hilltop cemetery. I just have a thing about reading books about cemeteries as well. It suits his withdrawn personality and the inexplicable occurrences that happen from time to time rattle him less than interaction with the living. But when his best and only friend, the kind but impulsive Jacob Lampton, is conscripted to serve overseas, Blackburn is charged with caring for Jacob's wife, Naomi as well. 16 year old Naomi Claire is an outcast in Blowing Rock, an outsider, poor and uneducated, who works as a seasonal maid in the town's most elegant hotel love a book again around a hotel when naomi elopes with jacob a few months after her arrival the marriage scandalizes the community most of all his wealthy parents who disinherit him shunned by the townsfolk for their differences and equally fearful that jacob may never come home Blackburn and Naomi grow closer and closer until a shattering development derails numerous lives. A tender examination of male friendship and rivalry as well as a riveting page-turning novel of familial devotion. The caretaker brilliantly depicts the human capacity for delusion and destruction 
all too often justified as acts of love. So it sounds like there is a lot going on there. It sounds very literary. I love historical fiction as well and this just sounds a little bit different. I feel like there should be a little bit of chronic illness slash disability representation in here as of the polio and everything as well so I'm really looking forward to reading this. This is one like I know nothing about the author, I had never really heard of it before, it just came up on my radar. Liked the cover, had a little read about it and I actually thought it sounded really good. So that's it for the 26th of September. After that we have two on the 10th of October. So one again is by an author that needs absolutely no introduction. So it's Cassandra Clare's newest book and it is called, I think, Sword Catcher. I'm just looking it up here. Yes, there we go. And it's number one in a new Cassandra Clare series. So if you've been here a while, you know I have been very devoted to reading through the Mortal Instruments series for the very first time. And I'd just be interested in reading kind of maybe more of Cassandra Clare's contemporary books just to kind of give them a go and see because I do have problems with the Mortal Instruments but mostly I put them aside as oh it's because they were written that long ago or you know we'll forgive it but I'm interested to see if she's kind of gotten over her little issues that I would have with her so this one is then about two outcasts find themselves at the centre of world altering change in the start of a riveting epic fantasy series from the number one New York Times bestselling author of the Shadowhunter Chronicles. In the vibrant city state of Castellan, the richest of nobles and the most debauched of criminals have one thing in common, the constant search for wealth, power and the next hedonistic thrill. Kel is an orphan stolen from the life he knew to become the sword catcher, the body double of a royal heir, Prince Connor Aurelian. He has been raised alongside the prince, trained in every aspect of combat and statecraft. He and Connor are closest brothers, but Kel knows he has one destiny, to die for Connor. No other future is possible. Lancaster is one of the Ashkar, a small community who still possess magical abilities. By law, they must live behind walls in the city, but Lynn, a physician, ventures out to tend to the sick and dying of Castellan. Despite her skills, she cannot heal her best friend, Mariam, without access to the forbidden knowledge. After a failed assassination attempt brings Lynn and Kel together, they're drawn into the web of the mysterious Ragpicker King, the criminal ruler of Castellan's underworld. He offers them each what they want most, but as they descend into his world of intrigue and shadow, they discover a conspiracy of corruption that reaches from the darkest gutters of Castellan to the highest tower of its palaces. As long kept secrets begin to unravel, they must ask themselves, is knowledge worth the price of betrayal? Can forbidden love bring down a kingdom? And will Lynn and Kel's discoveries plunge their nation into war and the world into chaos? This is another one that, look, could go either way for me. It sounds really interesting, it sounds like there's a lot going on, but who knows? I will probably pick it up from my library rather than buying it because I'm a little bit unsure on it but I'm looking forward to that one. So on the same day there's another book coming out by an author again that I've never read from but it is called What We Kept To Ourselves and it's by Nancy Yoon Kim. I really like that cover. It has me kind of wondering what the story is here. So again we're reading the blurb. I'm sorry for so much reading and not so much chatting today but here we are. So the New York Times bestselling author of the Reese's Book Club picked the last story of Mina Lee returns with a timely and surprising new novel about a family's search for answers following the disappearance of their mother. 1999, the Kim family is struggling to move on after their mother Sonny vanished a year ago. 61-year-old John Kim feels more isolated from his grown children than ever before, but one evening their fragile lives are further upended when John finds the body of a stranger in the backyard carrying a letter to Sonny, leaving the family with more questions than ever about the stranger's history and possible connections to their mother. And then there is more as we move back, they move back into 1977 as well. I won't read the whole thing because I don't want to give away the whole story. Again, we have a bit of historical fiction. I'm really intrigued by this idea of this person showing up in the backyard with a letter. It just sounds really interesting. I'm really curious about it. I again have no experience with this author so I don't know if their writing will gel with me but I'm hoping so. And then the following week on the 17th of October we have another one and it's called The Unmaking of June Farrow. Now this book is written by Adrienne Young. Um, 
of Spells for Forgetting fame. So this is a book that I literally have sitting on my bookshelf from my library at the moment and I'm really looking forward to getting around to it. I've heard really good things about it. But this new one sounds really interesting. I feel kind of drawn in by the cover even though it gives like nothing away and may have nothing to do with the book. As we go, it's a woman risks everything to end her family centuries old curse, solve her mother's disappearance and find love in this mesmerizing novel from the New York Times best-selling author of Spells for Forgetting. In the small mountain town of Jasper, North Carolina, June Farrow is waiting for fate to find her. The Farrow women are known for their thriving flower farm and the mysterious curse that has plagued their family line. The whole town remembers the madness that led to Susanna Farrow's disappearance, leaving June to be raised by her grandmother and haunted by rumours. It's been a year since June started seeing and hearing things that weren't there. Faint wind chimes, a voice calling her name and a mysterious door appearing out of nowhere, the signs of what June always knew was coming. But June is determined to end the curse once and for all, even if she must sacrifice finding love and having a family of her own. Again, I won't read any more of it because I don't want to give away too much. I feel like the book descriptions on Goodreads are a little bit too insightful sometimes. But um, it sounds really good, like a bit of a, um, like a family saga and there seems to be maybe a bit of magic or I don't know what, but it just sounds like something that's right up my street. It's kind of giving me, even though it's nothing like it, the last Karan Millwood Hargrave book, um, The Dan Street. It's like nothing to do with it, but for some reason it's kind of reminding me of that a little bit. Um, but I am really looking forward to that 17th of October. And then we have one that is out on Halloween. So on the 31st of October and it's called What the River Knows and it's by Isabel Ibanez. So Bolivian Argentinian Inez Oliveira belongs to the glittering upper society of 19th century Buenos Aires. And like the rest of the world, the town is steeped in old world magic that's been largely left behind or forgotten. Inez has everything a girl might want except for the one thing she yearns the most, her globe-trotting parents who frequently leave her behind. When she receives word of their tragic deaths, Inej inherits their massive fortune and a mysterious guardian, an archaeologist in partnership with his Egyptian brother-in-law. Yearning for answers, Inej sails to Cairo, bringing her sketch pads and an ancient golden ring her father sent to her for safekeeping before he died. But upon her arrival, the old world magic tethered to the ring pulls her down a path where she soon discovers there's more to her parents' disappearance than what her guardian led her to believe. This seems to have quite a bit of magic in it. I really like the setting of Cairo as well because I don't really read that many books kind of set around that part of the world. So it's one of these ones that just sounds like it's taking a lot of different facets and is set in quite a few different places and has a bit of a mystery. It definitely sounds like something that I really want to read. I wonder if the fact that it's being released on the 31st of October means it's a little bit spooky or it's just irrelevant. Then the next one that I'm going to speak about is one that probably needs very, very little introduction. So on the 7th of November we have two books that I actually can't wait to read. They're both the second book in a series. Now one of them I'll explain in a few minutes but the first one I'm going to speak about is Iron Flame by Rebecca Yaros. Rebecca Yaros wrote the infamous Fourth Wing. I read Fourth Wing not so long ago. I can't say that I loved it but I did really enjoy it. I found it a really quick fun easy read and it had great kind of disability chronic illness representation as well. Um, the author shares lucky for both of us the same connective tissue disorder that I have so and I've never read a book in which now it doesn't explicitly say in the book that she has this particular connective tissue disorder but it's very heavily coded so um, we're back in the world of Violet and Zayden Rearson and I'll just read you a bit of the blurb again. So the first year is when some of us lose our lives, the second year is when the rest of us lose our humanity. That sounds quite uh, dramatic doesn't it? So everyone expected Violet Sarangale to die during her first year at Basquiat War College, Violet included, but threshing was only the first impossible test meant to weed out the weak-willed, the unworthy and the unlucky. Now the real training begins and Violet's already wondering how she'll get through. It's not just that it's grueling and maliciously brutal, or even that it's designed to stretch the writer's capacity for pain beyond endurance. It's the new vice commandant who's made it his personal mission to teach Violet exactly how powerless she is unless she betrays the man she loves 
Although Violet's body might be weaker and frailer than everyone else's, she still has her wits and a will of iron. And leadership is forgetting the most important lesson Basquiat has taught her. Dragon riders make their own rules. But a determination to survive won't be enough this year because Violet knows the real secret hidden for centuries at Basquiat War College and nothing, not even Dragonfire, may be enough to save them in the end. So again, just sounds pure ridiculous but fantastic in its own way. Really looking forward to getting back into this world to see where we go. I remember the ending of Fourth Wing was a bit like, oh, okay, fair enough. So I'm really looking forward to getting back to that. I know it's quite controversial. I know some people like think it's the worst thing ever, but I just really enjoyed the experience of reading it and was very much able to overlook the glaring, glaring issues <laughs> with the book. Maybe because I just was really impressed with the disability representation. And then again, another book coming out on the same date. If you've been around here for a while, you know that I just adored Legends and Lattes by Travis Baldry. Well friends, we have Bookshops and Bone Dust coming out by the same author and it is, I believe, like a prequel to Legends and Lattes, but where I don't really care about coffee all that much, I really care about books. So I'm really excited for this. So this world of Viv, who is an orc, who in Legends and Lattes decides that she just wants to give up the life of kill for hire and wants to do something a little bit more chilled out her back hurts she just wants an easier life and she works hard to get it and that's that's legends and lattes it's lovely it's not for everybody it's one of my favorite books so bookshops and bone dust i believe follows viv again but i think it is a prequel so when an injury throws a young battle-hungry orc off her chosen path, she may find that what we need isn't always what we seek. In Bookshops and Bone Dust, a prequel to Legends and Lattes, New York Times best-selling author Travis Baldry takes us on a journey of high fantasy, first loves and second-hand books. Yes. Viv's career with the notorious mercenary company Rackham's Ravens isn't going as planned. Wounded during the hunt for a powerful necromancer, she's packed off against her will to recuperate in the sleepy beach town of Merck. So far from the action that she worries she'll never be able to return to it. What's a thwarted soldier of fortune to do? Spending her hours at a beleaguered bookshop in the company of its foul-mouthed proprietor is the last thing Viv would have predicted, but it may be both exactly what she needs and the seed of changes she couldn't possibly imagine. Still, adventure isn't all that far away. A suspicious traveller in grey, a gnome with a chip on her shoulder, a summer fling and an improbable number of skeletons prove Merc to be more eventful than Viv could ever have expected. So, I mean, look, I feel like I'm probably gonna get more of the same but it doesn't matter. Like, that's exactly what I'm here for. I would imagine that if you didn't enjoy Legends and Lattes that you're just not gonna enjoy this book. So look, I'm excited for it. Maybe some of you will be too. And then we have another sequel then as well. I believe it was supposed to have been out in January, but the date was pushed back. So, so on the 26th of December, then we have Ruthless Vows by Rebecca Ross. So this is the second in the Letters of Enchantment series. So the first one was The Infamous Divine Rivals, which again, I really loved, really enjoyed just wasn't expecting it and I'm really looking forward to getting back into this world. This is the epic conclusion to the intensely romantic and beautifully written story that started in Divine Rivals. Two weeks have passed since Iris Winnow returned home bruised and heartbroken from the front but the war is far from over. The next line is a spoiler so I'm not gonna read that. Look I can't really read a whole lot of that. So in Divine Rivals we had our main character and she was working for a newspaper company and her brother went off to war a few months prior and she hasn't heard from him since. She's worried about him, but she's working for this newspaper and she has a rival for a particular job. So she's an intern and this guy is an intern as well. And they're up against each other for this one job. And she eventually kind of moves to the front where a war is being fought and 
it's a war between gods, but we don't see a whole lot of the whole gods at war thing. We do see a little bit of like war in and of itself. So I'm looking forward to some more kind of explanation, more backstory into the gods, etc. As we move into this second book, I am really looking forward to figuring out like what happens. Considering the ending of the first book, I thought was really good, but it was a bit like, oh, that's it. I want to know more. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, please excuse me for reading at you more so today than actually chatting, but I don't actually know too much about these books. Also, please forgive me if the dates are a bit confused on these books. At the time that I did my research, those were the dates that I got and presumably those are dates for the UK and Ireland. Again, could be wrong, but I did my best. I did my very best. Um, let me know if you're looking forward to any of these books. Um, let me know what you're actually looking forward to yourself. Is there anything on your radar that I haven't mentioned that just sounds really good to you? If you enjoyed this video, please don't hesitate to leave a like or to subscribe. You're always most welcome here. I really hope that you're minding yourself, that you're minding each other. Please chat with me down in the comments if you have anything at all you'd like to say. I look forward to chatting to you very soon as ever. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.